A Pocket of Time, The Poetic Childhood of Elizabeth Bishop. Words by Rita Wilson and art by Emma Fitzgerald. Introduction. A little girl lies sick in bed with a rattly chest. A doctor, leaning over, asks her to stick out her tongue. He makes a rhyme. Lambs say ba, can you say ah? She laughs in delight. That same girl, healthy again, is getting ready for church. Her grandmother polishes her Sunday shoes using gasoline to clean the white tops and Vaseline for the patent leather bottoms. The girl marches around all day chanting, Vaseline, gasoline, Vaseline, gasoline. Years later, she said, it may not have been a poem, but it was my first rhyme. That girl, Elizabeth Bishop, grew up to become a famous poet. She was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1911 to William and Gertrude Bishop. Her father died when she was a baby, and after his death, she spent time in the small town of Great Village, Nova Scotia, where her mother's parents, Gammy and Pa, to Elizabeth, lived in a white clabbered house. It was at Gammy and Pa's that Elizabeth remembered learning to walk, to read, to write, to sing hymns, and to catch bumblebees in foxglove flowers. It's where she first went to school, and when she was five, it's where her mother left for the Nova Scotia Hospital, a mental hospital also known as Mount Hope, from which she never returned. And it is a Gamian pause that this story takes place. Turn the page and you will enter Elizabeth's great village world. My words will take you, along with Elizabeth, through each room in Gammy and Pa's house and out into the town. This book has been inspired by Elizabeth's own writing, the poems and stories she wrote about that piece of her childhood when she lived in Great Village with Gammy and Pa, her own words, which you will see in italics, in quotation marks, in stamps, and further noted in the back of this book, will tell you what she played, what she learned, what she noticed. They will also tell you what confused her what excited her, and what she wondered about. Meet this girl who fell in love with words and who used her childhood memories to recreate her great village world for each of us. Walk up the path on the side of the house, past the landmark elm, past the fox gloves, the cosmos, the Johnny Jump Ups. Elizabeth sits on the back steps, peeling the paper off her slate pencil. Holding a slate on her lap, Gammy has taught her to write her name. The the names of people in her family and their dogs and cat dog and cat. She notices the letters she makes have a different expressions. Sometimes the capital E and B in her name look almost sad, but other times they turn fat and cheerful, almost with roses in their cheeks. Elizabeth is singing as she walks to the horse trough trough, but her songs stopped partway through. For a long time, she would only sing the alphabet to the letter G, satisfied with the shape of the short tune until someone laughed at her, and quickly she decided to go all the way to Z. She loves to wash her slate in the watering trough, watching the letters and words disappear. It dried like clouds. Gammy must have called to Elizabeth. She's in the kitchen, tasting something on a wooden spoon, potato mash for tomorrow's bread. Elizabeth thinks it tastes wonderful, but wrong. She notices Gammy crying while stirring the mash and wonders if it's the taste of her tears. She kisses Gammy and tastes her tears on her cheek. With crayons, the child draws a man with buttons like tears. Walk into the pantry of the kitchen, long and narrow. It stores all kinds of things in its 27 drawers and cupboards. Elizabeth is on the floor, opening the door to her shelf. There are old books and toys in a strawberry basket inside. In the basket are the marbles she's been searching for. The biggest, the one Elizabeth thinks is the most beautiful, is shiny and pink, made of crockery, like the cup she drinks tea with, with milk from in the morning. When she picks it up, it moves her, almost to tears to look at it. It's supper time, and everyone is around the dining room table. Inside, a cage hanging from a hook in the ceiling, a canary nibbles chickweed that Gammy sent Elizabeth across the road to pick. Earlier, you would have heard Pa saying grace. 
always the same way. Elizabeth thinks that when he says, we must have reasons to thank thee, he's actually saying, we have reasons to thank thee. Supper is finished. The lamp has yet to be lit. The day is moving from dusk to dark. Elizabeth looks at the window panes and notices the reflection there. She sees herself, she sees her grandmother, and wonders, where were they before? Here we, are, we are all at were, at last, doubly together. Not quite bedtime, they gather in the sitting room. Pa is in his Morris chair reading the newspaper. Nanny, the cat on his lap. Aunt Mary reading McLean's magazine. Elizabeth is on the floor coloring. There are books on the table by Pa's chair. Sometimes he reads poetry out loud. Robbie Burns is his favorite, and Pa reads his poems with a bit of a Scottish accent. Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. Gammy is tatting lace. With her one good eye, her glass eye sometimes looks off at an angle, while her real eye looks right at you. Both eyes are almost the same color blue, but to Elizabeth, the glass eye makes her especially, especially vulnerable and precious. The empty parlor is a special occasion room. Perhaps that's the reason Elizabeth feels it belongs to her. She likes to sit in the chair by the window and look for the curtains out into the street, just like Gammy does from her rocker in the kitchen. She likes the sense of seclusion. For Elizabeth, it is the one place where I think could think from a distance. She likes the parlor carpet with its design of roses and the old square piano with the best oil lamps on either end and the rainbow frame letters in her grandfather's Bible, all the little words on the pages linked by Anne's and the pages edged with guilt. The guilt rubs off the edges of the papers and pollinates the fingertips. When it's time for bed, Pa holds an oil lamp as Elizabeth climbs the ladder stairs, ladder-like stairs to her room. Gammy calls from the sitting room to Elizabeth to say her prayers. After Pop puts her to bed, he puts the lamp turned low on the sewing machine table in the hall and leaves the, her door ajar. He doesn't want Elizabeth to be afraid of the dark, even though she tells him that she's not. Elizabeth loves her kind and jokey grandfather. He's her favorite relative. How far north are we by now? I'm almost close enough to see you under the North Star. Elizabeth sleeps in the little room, right next to her Aunt Mary's. It is special because it has skylight over the bed. She was sick a lot last summer with bronchitis. To fill the time, Gammy let her play with the button back basket, so big and full it must have weighed 10 pounds. Filled with everything from the metal snaps for men's overalls to a set of large cut steel buttons. And the scrap bag filled with familiar pieces of fabric, one from Pa's shirt, another from someone else's pants, there's even a scrap from the house dress Gammy's wearing right now. Better yet is a crazy quilt Gammy made, every piece of silk or velvet um, telling a tale about a person in the village. Gammy has collected them all from friends over the years, getting each friend to write her name, their name in pencil on their piece. Then she stitches their names into chains of colored silk thread. Best of all is when Gammy comes to, at the end of the day. The dark comes early, and Gammy wraps Elizabeth in a blanket and places her on her lap in the rocking chair. They rock back and forth, back and forth. Gammy sings hymns to her. I'm full of hymns, by the way, and I often catch echoes from them in my own poems. The front bedroom, with slanted ceiling and um, striped wallpaper, is the largest out of the windows window or elm trees, lilac bushes and a gray roof patch with moss that belongs to the blacksmith shop next door. Um, at the end of the hall and right next to Elizabeth is Gertrude, her mother's room. My ears could listen, listen, often nothing could be heard. There was a time when her mother came and went to and from Great Village, then she was gone. Now the front bedroom is empty. As she lays in bed, in the soft light from the hallway, Elizabeth can hear almost every word that Gammy and Pa speak from their bedroom across the hall. She has, a little, she has a little picture with big ears, listening for the stories and secrets in the night. 
talking the way they talked in that old feather bed peacefully on and on. There are mornings when Elizabeth can't bear to wait for Aunt Mary, who spends a lot of her time upstairs braiding her hair, tying and retying the bow on her midi blouse to leave for school. She finds her slate in the rag to wash it, fills the medicine bottle with water, leans over to pat Betsy, their dash hound, kick goodbye, kisses Grammy, making her promise not to die before she comes home, and heads out on her own. Waving to Nate in the black smith shop, Elizabeth walks into the one-lane metal bridge that rumbles when he horses and wagons drive over. Stands by the railing, she loves to stare at the river rushing by, watching the too-smart-to-get-caught trout as they swim past a long, sunk, um, rusting fender. Once in a while, the river gives an unexpected expected gurgle slip, it says. Then Elizabeth hears the first bell and hurries on. The school up ahead, tall and white, a dark red roof, cupola on top. Elizabeth walks quickly, anxious to get there before the second bell rings. Inside are rows of desks bolted to the floor, two mats hanging from the wall. Fac fascinate, Elizabeth. I was so taken with the pull-down maps that I wanted to touch all the countries and provinces with my own hands. One great room holds primary to fourth, to grade four. The teacher, Georgie, Morish listens to the children reading Pointer in Hand. Elizabeth loves the older children's stories. They have so much more interesting than the short one she's memorized in her own small brown primer. <clears throat> she's colored many of the pictures in the book and written her name over and over in her embryotic handwriting. On her way home, Elizabeth hears the sounds of the blacksmith shop. Clang, clang. Nate's song, the creak of the bellows, the hammering, the horseshoe into place. Elizabeth stops and calls out, Make me a ring, Nate! Nate hands her something so quickly it's still hot, and it's hers, it is. Blue and shiny, the horseshoe nail has a flat, oblong head pressing hot against my knuckle. Gammy's waiting for the porch, and after admiring Elizabeth's ring, hands her a package to take to the po post office. Elizabeth walks through the black blacksmith shop, pretending she doesn't hear Nate's greeting, and then over the bridge, past M M Millie's shop, to the tilting over post office. S she stands at the outside window while Mr. Johnson, the postmaster, reaches for the package she is tightly grasping. Every Monday, Gammy fills a box with treats, fruit, cake, and cake, wild strawberry jam, handkerchief with a tatted edge, books for Elizabeth's mother, mother in the mental hospital. Every Monday, Elizabeth carries the package out to the post office, holding it against her body to hide the address. The address of the sanatorium it is in my grandmother's handwriting. It'll never come off. While she's there, she goes inside to see if there's mail in their box, number 21. Sometimes there are postcards. Today is one of those times. Often they come from Boston from the other grandparents who send things through the mail. Elizabeth has noticed a lot of things in the village are from Boston. She knows that too, that she too once lived there. But I remember only being here. Hurrying home, Elizabeth gives Gammy the postcard, knowing it's time to get Nellie, the Jersey cow, from Chris Holmes' pasture. It's her favorite chore, marching for the vi village with a big stick directing her. And when Elizabeth gets up the hill to the pasture, she loves to look out over the entire village. There are tops of all the elm trees in the village, and there, beyond them, the long green marsh is so fresh, so salt. She finds Nellie with her drool-like grass, glass strings and her shiny blue nose, gives her hip bone a whack with a stick, and heads down the hill. They walk past the clan farm, fat past the Prosperiton manse, avoiding the Miss Spencer's lilac bush as they make their way home. It's almost supper time when Elizabeth gets home, and Jamie says it's time to get fixed up. She lets Elizabeth brush her silver hair, full of combs and matching silver-colored celluloids. Elizabeth stands on the rung of the rocking chair, swaying and brushing, pretending 
play a tune before we stick them in so my grandmother's hair is full of music. It come, Pa comes to wash up and while he's drying his hands, Gary shows him the postcard. He shakes his head, murmuring, oh, pshaw, and Gary repeats her familiar refrain, nobody knows, nobody knows. Elizabeth wonders what message that postcard contains and asks, what do you know, Gam know Gammy, that we don't know? There are always so many things to wonder about, although there are more. These are all the memories I want to keep on remembering. Postscript. When Elizabeth was six, her father's parents, those other grandparents who had been no more than postcards and packages from Boston, decided that she should live with them in their big house in Worcester, Massachusetts. They came to Great Village and took Elizabeth away with them on the train. She had not been asked, and she would not have agreed. Little did she know, it was the beginning of a life filled with journeys, some happy, some sad, that took her many places in the world. She came back to Great Village each summer for the next 10 years, while Gammy and Pa were still alive. 35 years later, living far away in Brazil, Elizabeth used these Great Village memories to write some of her most famous poems and stories. She said, it's funny to come to Brazil to experience total recall about Nova Scotia. Geography must be more mysterious than we realize, even. One of those poems, A Short, Slow Life, is about that time in Great Village before she was taken away. It begins, we lived in a pocket of time. It was close, it was warm. That first line not only became the title of this book, it also became my inspiration to learn about that great village time through Bishop's own work. Her words painted a picture that was filled with details that slid into poetry about a child's life, Elizabeth's own life with Gammy and Pa, until she was forced to move away. All these things that happened in Elizabeth's childhood put home and the search for home at the heart of her life and her writing. When I wrote this book, there's a dedication, and the dedication says, this is for the children. And one of those children is Rose, a poet rising, my granddaughter. And her name is? Rose Richter. 